where we kind of started, wherefore I, and that's the Apostle Paul, was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, under the principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, come this morning as we look at this passage and we look at the, the details here of your plan and your purpose, and as we begin to study these out, we would just rejoice and have a heart of thanksgiving that we're participants in all of this. And what you've decided to do, you've included us in it and allowed us to, to uh, have uh, this message been given to us. And we'll just thank you for that. In your name we pray, amen. We started last time this issue here uh, about us and the local assembly. And we, we looked last time there about the fellowship of the mystery uh, in, in verse 9 to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And we kind of went at it in a reverse manner because this morning we're going to look at make all men see, okay? And the issue here of the fellowship of the mystery, that's really verse 6. If you look back up at verse 2, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Then you see the, the parenthesis. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That, <clears throat> verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, notice very carefully, by the Spirit. That's very, those, every word so far is critically important. When he says there, as I wrote a four and a few words, everybody says, well, that's the book of Ephesians and these few words he's written. I'm going to take it as in all of his epistles that he's been writing, okay? But the thing is, is what did he write about? And then he says, the mystery of Christ. He doesn't just say the mystery. He says the mystery of Christ because there's two other mysteries. There's mystery of God and there's mystery of the Father and then there's the mystery of Christ. Colossians lays that out for us. So he's identifying down, boiling down what he's going to be talking about. Then he says, which in other ages was not made known, it's been hid. It's now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. How? By the Spirit. He doesn't say, Jesus Christ, verse 2, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how did he receive it? He received it directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. He turned around and he then delivers it to the body of Christ. He writes it down. You and I come along, the holy apostles and prophets. I, I love that. That reach back into the time when those uh, administrative gifts were active and so forth. By the way, that's in chapter 4 of Ephesians. We'll, we will get there one day, okay, in a few years. We'll get over there. We'll look at that. And what happens is, is he says, hey, if you want to know what's going on, the Spirit is the one that's going to reveal it. He's going to reveal it through the words that I've written down. Then he says, verse 6, that here's what the mystery is, that the Gentiles should be what? fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ. How? By the gospel. The Gentiles, those uncircumcised, no good, dirty rotten dogs over there. That group of people that he cut off in Genesis 17. That group of people that he looks at his, uh, his 12 apostles and he says, don't you go talk to that Gentile over there. Don't even look at them. When they come down the street, you go on the other side. I'm just kidding. I, just don't mess with them. It's not your job. Their job was to get that little flock together. By the way, Gentile salvation is the theme of, is a part of the theme of the Old Testament. Because the Abrahamic covenant said that your seed's going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So ultimately, Gentile salvation. But it wasn't the 12's job. It wasn't the earthly ministry of Christ. It wasn't his job. It's, now it's whose job? 
It's Paul's job. It's the church, the body of Christ's job. Now we're going to go to the Gentiles. That's why he says, verse 7, Wherefore I was made a minister according to the... I, I love the way Paul writes this. The Holy Spirit writes, The gift of the grace of God. He says over to the... Uh, I just had the verse. Isn't that stupid? Anyway, verse 8, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The fellowship of the mystery, I tried to say it last time, and I lost the train of thought, just like I did it again. It's like crazy, you know. You know how, I don't know, but if you've ever taught anything in, your, in life, you get it in there and you've been working on it, you've been, boom, I'm going to give them this. I'm going to preach this thing like six times in the shower, you know. It's like, rah, rah, rah. and then you get up here and you lose all train of thought. And it's like, wait a minute, bring the caboose back. <laughs> bring the engine back, you know. The fellowship of the mystery. Fellowship. Fellows in a ship. We share in common this information about what God's doing today in the dispensation of grace, the forming of the church, the body of Christ. We're all equal. Uh, hold on, uh, Ephesians. Just go back to Galatians 3, a passage that constantly needs to kind of be in the back forefront of our mind. Galatians 3, verse 28. When he talks here about the fellowship of the mystery, it has to do with the body of Christ. It has to do with us being a part of, fellow heirs of what God's doing today, all on an equal basis, no special status, no one's higher than the other. We're all blessed. We're all complete. We're all this on the same board. Now, we've chosen different roles in the body, but we have all equality. Uh, Galatians 3.28, for there is neither Jew nor Greek, so is there a Jew and a Greek issue today? No. There's neither bond nor free. That's, a, so, that's an economic status. Bond slave, bond servant, someone who's indentured, has a bill to pay, or free, all the debt's paid off. There's neither man, male nor female. Well, wait a minute. Are there difference between males and females? Yeah. But not when it comes to what God's doing in the church, the body of Christ. He'll say in another passage, there's no Scythian, no, no Greek. There's no status. God's, everyone is what? For all have sinned. We're all equal. We're all on the same board. So when he says here, we're going to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The issue here is, we share, we all share equally. God is rich to you as he is to me in Christ Jesus. We're all on the same, the, 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 the song, the, the foot is level, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It's all equal. Now, the degree in which you take the wealth, look, look back there at Ephesians 2. I'm sorry, Ephesians 3. The, unsearch, the end of verse 8, the unsearchable riches of Christ, the degree in which you take the wealth, the riches of Christ, and then you begin to put those into your life, that's up to you. That isn't God. You know, my dad always said, God doesn't bore a hole in your head and dump it in. You have to do what? What's the 2 Timothy 2.15 say? First word, study. You have to come to the table. You see, it's your walk of faith. It's, it's you living in the identity and who you are in Christ. It's taking that identity, who you are. You, think about Romans 6, 7, and 8. We're in it in Sunday school. <laughs> We're in 8. We're in some shaky ground for some in 8. But you think about 6, Romans 6, when he says, You're, you, you that, well, just look over there. Don't think about it. Let's read it, okay? This is when the overhead goes away. The lights turn out. Romans 6, verse 6, knowing this, 
that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. What's the declaration there? That's a declaration of who you are. Who are you? You're freed from sin. You shouldn't be serving the sin. That's why he says, verse 7, for he that is dead is what? It's not free. It's freed. It's done from sin. Well, wait a minute, Rick. Sin still creeps in. No kidding. What's my relationship to that sin? I'm dead. That's what verse 7 is saying. He that is dead. Dead to what? Dead to that relationship you have with sin. You've, it's been severed. It's been cut away. So Colossians 2 talks about the circumcision of God made without hands, where He reaches in and He sets you free from the bondage of this flesh. And you choose to live there or not. That's on you. Your walk of faith. You're wanting to come along and say, you know what? I'm dead to sin. I know I mess up. And Paul never said you don't mess up anymore. He says when you do mess up, here's how to think about it. Let's not do it again. <laughs> how did I get there? Let's never do that again, you know? Let's stop. That's why in Titus 2 he'll say, that the grace of God teaching us to deny ungodly. Do you know what it is to deny something? Stop. I've been on a weight loss campaign for 49 years of my life. <laughs> okay? I Guess what? I've lost for a good chunk of it. But you know what? I go to the doctor. My, my, I had my accident in November of 19 on my motorcycle, and I hurt my feet, and I didn't know it at the time. I hurt both of them bad, actually. I didn't know it because, I, you know, you get shook up, and you're just glad to be breathing, you know. Well, as time has come away, that those I broke my feet, basically, is what I did. Those have come up. They've begun to manifest themselves. So I go to the doctor, and the doctor says, lose weight. I'm like, no kidding, dude. Tell me something I don't know. I already, you know. He goes, no, if you lose weight, that will help your feet. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to have surgery and you're going to be a year, year and a half in rehab and it is not a good surgery to have. And he was explaining it to me. He goes, here, just go YouTube it. I went YouTube it. I'm like, uh uh. I am no more eating. Boom, done. You know, you give it to me by an IV or something. You know, no, I didn't do that. But, so, he, I, so we did some tests and stuff, and he said, look, three areas, cut them out. Sugar, wheat, dairy, boom, cut them out. You do that, you'll start losing the weight gradually, the way you're supposed to lose it, blah, 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 all this stuff. So you know what I did? Two out of three can't be bad, right? You know? So that's what I did. Guess what? It didn't tick at all. So I'm like, all right, I better do three out of three. You know what I found out I needed to be dead to? Those three items. And you know what happened? It started coming down slow. And, you know, until Linda last night says, I want a root beer float. And I'm like, that sounds really good. So we go to the freezer and you pull out the, the Schwann's vanilla ice cream and, and then a little AW root beer. And you go... I got to go to the bathroom because this is hurting now. Why? Because I haven't had any of that. By the way, it did taste pretty good. <laughs> okay? But I don't miss it, you know? What do you learn? Who do you become? You become, the, here's your identity. You got to make a choice. This is who I'm going to walk in. Chapter 7, he says, you know what? You're dead, you're dead to sin. Chapter 6, you're dead to the law. The law doesn't play into your identity. Is the law righteous? Oh, yes, it is. God was teaching the law to Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Seth, all of those guys back there, up to Noah. He was teaching them. Abraham knew the law. You think about what Abraham was doing by bringing a sacrifice to Melchizedek. Who in the world, what is that all about? And it was the right sacrifice, the lamb. Why? Because God was teaching him the law. Moses shows up and says, okay, now the law is an if and then principle. Before it wasn't, it was just, here's what God would have us do. And so he writes the preamble, the Ten Commandments to the, to the law. And guess what Israel did? Strike one on number one. <laughs> Gone. 
They went after other gods and all this stuff. And God, Paul says, you don't live under the law. You live under grace. Cut yourself some grace. Put yourself, don't put yourself under a performance acceptance system. Put yourself under a gift system. And then he comes into chapter 8 and he says, oh, now, by the way, go back to Ephesians 3. He says, hey, listen, you know what you are? You're dead to sin. You're dead to the law. You're freed from that life. You can live in, in total victory. You're free to live as who you are in Christ under grace. And when you mess up, you know what the wonderful thing about messing up? Is that God doesn't reach down and zap you with a bolt of lightning. He doesn't reach down and put you over his knee like a disobedient child and spank you. He's got his scripture to come in and reproof and correct you. Look, And he says, I'm going to deal with you graciously. And then in chapter 8 he says, you're dead to the flesh. You don't mind the things of the flesh. Let the Spirit come in and work in you. And oh, by the way, you know who you really are? You're in a son of God. That's who you are. Act like it. Live like it. That's who you are. I think about that son, the son of God. The angels were called the sons of God. You remember Isaiah 14, Lucifer? He's called son of the morning. That word son is there. Isaiah, John 1, he looks over there in John 1 and he says, he's going to make, he, uh, he came into his own and his own received him not. And to them that received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. You know why he's sons of God, sons of God, sons of God? Because God wants his creation run by sons, adults. He doesn't want it run by children. He doesn't want it run by, you know what you do with a child? Do this, don't do that. He doesn't want that. He wants an adult relationship with his creation. And you know what an adult relationship says? I think I'll do this. No, I, don't, I think I'll do this. And he wants a genuine participation by his creation to worship him. So he uses that term, sons of God, sons of the morning, son, adults. You know, a child, well, they do what they're told. He's like, I don't want to have to tell you what to do. I have my word. I've given you my word. Here's what I'm going to accomplish. And I want you to come and participate with that. And what you learn in Romans 8 is this great plan that he has for us to come and be a part of. And he says, oh, man, come and just live as who you are. And when you learn that and when you begin to walk in that, you begin to move into your daily lives that identity. You know what you begin to do? You begin to make all men see. That's what you begin to do. And what you begin to do is you begin to make all men see what is that fellowship, that oneness that we have in Christ. That issue of, he's got this big plan. Have you ever asked anybody if they know what God's doing today? And then shut up and listen to what they say. And you find out they have no clue. Have you ever asked anyone what they think about the Bible? Usually they say, what, it's pretty hard to understand. I don't get it. And they have no clue. You do. And our job is to come along and to put that on display. Make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Now, if you'll notice verse 9, Ephesians 3. I've got to get back in the passage or we'll never get to lunch. <clears throat> And by the way, we are going to lunch. <laughs> We're going to get there eventually. Look at Ephesians 3. Look at verse 9 again. Look at the first word. It's a what? It's an and. It's a continuation out of the thought in verse 8. What's Paul, and by the way, verse 8 here, this is Paul's goal, Paul's ministry verse. But sometimes people say that over there in 1 Corinthians 2 when he says, I can't know anything among you but Christ crucified, that that's his mantra, and that is not his mantra. His, that, by the way, that is such a rebuke to the Corinthians of not growing. He says, listen, all I can know amongst you guys is the milk of this matter. I want to give you the meat. I want to get you the potatoes. I want you at the big people's, the adult table. And you're down here over here playing in the, in, in the mush. And he says, I can't. You know what? Here's his mantra. You know what my job is? To preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. 
Paul's job, our job as ambassadors, if you will, is to preach and to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's our job. That's why on the overhead I've got that little thing about a, a successful evangelistic outing. is isn't getting the result, it's giving the Word. You get the Word. Let the Word do its work. Let the Holy Spirit do that. He will. But man, if you sit there and you're living your life as who you are in Christ and you put on display the unsearchable riches of Christ and you begin to make that important and a part of your life and then somebody say, and you say, hey, uh, we were talking yesterday, Juan, he, uh, uh, Joe's buddy was there and he's like, we were talking about COVID or something and he's like, well, they get all upset about that. I usually ask them where they know, if they died from that, where would they spend eternity? <laughs> I'm like, you know what, that's a good way into that, you know? If people blow up and they want this and that, well, hey, let me ask you. Oh, I don't want to talk about that. He was telling me. He goes, well, then I don't want to talk about that over there. So we're at an impasse. Let me go back to do my job because we're talking about work and stuff. Well, look, you man, you got an opportunity. What happens? Preach, proclaim the message, and make all men see. What is the fellowship of the mystery? To make all men see. Notice it doesn't say understand it. It doesn't say make all men understand it. It says make all men see it. That's critical because what do, in our thinking do we want them to do? Understand it doesn't say that. It says, I want, we're to make all men see it. I'm out here proclaiming it, preaching it, but I also want to put it on display so people can see it. I want people to look at my life and know there's something different. I want them to look at my life and hear my talk, my language, my discussions, see my decisions, and know that there's something different. Come over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You see, when Paul gets into this, he, he's, he's, he gets to meddling, really, but look at 1 Corinthians 2, and look at verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish unto him, neither can he know them, because they are how? What? Spiritually discerned. Do you know that if you go up and you, and you provide all things honest before all men, Romans 12? Do you know that if you uh, let not your good be evil spoken of, have a right reputation? Do you know that if you go over here and, you, and you're not complaining and criticizing and condemning the three C's I grew up with? You don't have to say one word about being a Christian or a believer. People know you're different. They do. You don't believe me, try it. When they get that big blow up about COVID and all that stuff, and you just sit there and you're pleasant about it, and your demeanor is not aggressive and angry, but rather peace, of, peace and joy. I don't, I don't know if you've thought about that. We have had folks here get COVID and pass away. Where are they? In glory. Good for them. So what a mindset to have. Not that you got to get sick. It's that sick stuff, that hurts. That's suffering. I ain't doing But look at, instead of getting all balled up, <laughs> twisted in knots about it, just say, hey, okay, it's what you want. But man, have you ever thought about where you're going to go spend eternity? The unsaved, they don't get it. Yet, what did Paul say in, in 3 9? We're to make what? All men. That's including the unsaved. Look over at chapter 15 of Romans. I don't know if you thought about this, folks, but your interaction with the unsaved world is just as critical as it is with other believers. Because they have no, they have no clue what's going on. They are children of disobedience, they're under the spirit of the course of this world. They are blinded. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the law. They are blind. They are in darkness. And you show up with a little bit of ray of light. 
And all you're doing is putting on display the unsearchable riches of His grace. Look, if you will, at Romans 15. Look at verse 18. And we're just jumping in, so the doctrine and so forth, but I just want you to see how and what Paul says about this. For I will not... 1518, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient, now watch, by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Iliacrum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Do you see that end of verse 18? The Gentiles being obedient by what? Word and deed. Now, in the context, you run back into Acts. Remember, he's on a little island in Miletum, and the viper jumps out and bites him, and he shakes it off, and nothing happens to him. And that whole tribe, the chief and all those guys, see that, and what they say? This dude's something there weird going on right here. And, and the next thing you know, they're members of the body of Christ. Word and now, this is Paul. Well, it's okay. Paul's like, look, folks, your impact, you have an impact on the people around you. Come back to Romans chapter 1. The pro, the, we're proclaiming the message. We're preaching the gospel. We're seeing people get saved, come out of Adam and into Christ, learning who we are. And you know what happens? We are to put on display who we are in Christ. Look at Romans 1. Romans 1. And we're going to start making some shifts here into some things that are a little deeper than what Paul's getting at in Ephesians 3. Some things behind the scenes, if you will. Look at Romans 1. We'll start in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. When the wrath of God is revealed, when it's revealed, can you see it? Yeah. When he pours out his wrath, will the earth see it? Will man see it? Yeah, they're going to see it. It's going to be put on display. But now notice the passage. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. They take the truth of God and they hold it in an unrighteous way. Verse 25, who change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's man holding the truth of God in unrighteousness. They take the truth of God and they turn it to a lie. They worship the creature. You're your own God. You're your own absolute authority. You're your own. You're the end of end. You're the son of all. Some of all of it is you. And they turn that. So what does he do? Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God, watch, is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what? Clearly seen. Isn't that interesting? He's moving into creation here with you. Guess where we're going to move? We're going to move into creation here because there's some things going on. They're clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even so, even his eternal purpose and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Every person knows there's a God, verse 19. What are they designing to do? Hold the truth and unrighteousness. They know there's a God, so let's just create a let's create our own little religion over here. And let's get around that judgment. Let's say that there is no judgment of God anymore, that he's going to save everybody in the end. That's universalism, by the way. Let's not say that there's this. Let's just those verses don't mean what they say. They just that's just, oh, just spiritually take it into. Oh, it's God's ruling and reigning in the hearts of men. Don't you know that? And it, you look at this and you go, wait a minute. What's the verse say? Clearly seen. The eternal power and Godhead. Visible where? 
in creation. They're, there it is. They are on display. Put it on display. And the simple fact that in creation, he's displayed what? That he is creator. I love Genesis 1.1. Everybody wants to fight evolution. You know Genesis 1.1 deals with evolution? You don't have to fight about it. In the beginning, God created. First five words of the Bible. I've been watching the five-word thing. First five words. You know what what the five-word thing is? Uh, Come over to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Now I've got to find the verse. First Corinthians 14. Oh, where did it go? It talks about all these tongues, and I would speak five words. Uh, verse 19. First Corinthians 14, 19. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Five words. So I started looking for five words in Scripture. In the beginning, God created five words. Christ died for our sins, five words. It's just, it's all, they're all over the place. Five words. And he said unto me, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Five words. Paul says, you know what? Romans 1 You know what's clearly on display out there for all to see? The eternal power and Godhead. Man knows there's a creator. And in Ephesians 3, that's what Paul's talking about. Run back to Ephesians 3. When he says he will have to make all and to make all men see. That's what he's talking about, that idea in Romans 1.20. Clearly seen. No ambiguity. No maybes. No, this clearly seen that something is going on. Clearly on display. Putting on display in the life of the believer what's happening. Now, the wonderful thing about the book of Ephesians is that he's talking to the local church at Ephesus. And he's talking not only to the individual, you and I, but then he talks collectively to the whole church, the body of Christ. The whole of, of, Gala- of, of the book of Ephesians is the corporate church, the big. And he says, you know what? In the life of the believer, you know what you need to make manifest? Those unsearchable riches of Christ. But you know what you do as a local assembly when you come together? The work of the ministry, you do the same thing. If you look over at chapter 4, of Ephesians, verse 12, 4, 12, he says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and that's the theme. What we're doing here in the local assembly is we're putting on display the fellowship of the mystery. We're putting on display for all to see this invisible fellowship, this invisible equality that we have in Christ and with Christ. We have this, and we have, we're putting on display. When you, have, have you ever talked to somebody about magic? You know what magic is? Just the hands quicker than the eye? Routine? And they make some, something disappear? So you say, what, tell us the trick. How'd you do it? And, and a true magician will say what? Nope, not going to reveal my trick. You know what you and I are doing? We're taking something invisible, can't be seen, and we're putting it on display for all to see. We're taking the invisible, we're taking spiritual issues, and we're coming along and we're putting it on display for everyone. You think about the issue of forgiveness. Think about that. Have you been forgiven? Yes. You're in Ephesians. Look at Colossians 3. I, I try to think of things... And that's what half of this writing is, is trying to figure out how to articulate this. Colossians 3. Look at Colossians 3.13. 
Wonderful thing. I, I try to think about things that you and I can do with people, this unsearchable riches of Christ. Colossians 3.13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. Are you going to fight? You're going to have a quarrel? Yeah. Even amongst ourselves you are. By the way, that's who he's talking to really is the church at Colossae. But what are you to do? Well, you're to forgive and forbear. How do I forgive? How do I forbear? What's it look like? What, what are the dynamics of it? Well, he then tells you, doesn't he? Even as Christ forgave you, so also what? Do ye. That is a command, by the way. I know people don't like the commands. You know, Paul didn't command us. Baloney, that's a command right there. That's a, one of those things that I like to call a commandment of grace. You're to do this. You're to forgive and forbear. But what does it look like? As Christ did what? Forgave you. Ephesians 4, 3 over there, Ephesians 4, where he, the counter, tenderhearted, loving and forgiving one another as Christ. I just had it. I wrote this thing so many times as a kid. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. How did he do that? What did he do? He went and he paid your sin penalty, didn't he? Psalms says he took those sins and he goes, drops them off in the deep blue sea out there. They're gone. He comes over and he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take that sin, I'm going to put it behind me, and I'm never going to look back. He forgave you. Now, when he forgave you, did he do it 100% or did he do it 95 or 50 or 75 or did he say, I'm just going to bury it a little bit so I can pull the hatchet out later and nail you? No, he did it what? Completely and totally. If there was one sin he didn't forgive, then his death was just another death. You see, we, we can do what now? We know what it is to be forgiven, so now we can do what? We can go and forgive. How are we to forgive? 90%, 75 25 none at all, or 100%? See, forgive, true forgiveness doesn't say it didn't hurt. True forgiveness doesn't say that it doesn't, there wasn't an issue or a problem. Was your sin an issue and a problem? Yes, it was. And he did what? He dealt with it. What forgiveness says is, you know what I'm going to do? By faith and who I am in Christ, I'm not going to hold you accountable for your wrong of me. I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to drudge it up next week, wives, or sorry, okay? I'm not going to bring it up when the fight, when I'm losing the fight so I can win the fight. No, I, it's what? It's done. You see, true forgiveness is a decision. It's a choice. It's an act, action based on uh, your will, done by faith before God and where you choose to give up your right to hold another person accountable for the wrong. It doesn't not deal with the wrong. You go deal with it. You just choose to what? Have, let it be dealt with. It's done. So in 10 years down the road when you got him nailed up against the wall and you're hounding on it and you go, do you remember back in 2001? And you're like, no, I don't even remember yesterday, man. What are you talking? You know, you don't do that. You say, enough. It's done. You see, but you can do that with people. Doesn't see, forgiveness in Scripture does not let the wrong off the hook. Christ dealt with the wrong at Calvary. It successfully deals with it and says, it's done, and I'm not going to hold you accountable for, any, for it anymore. I'm going to let it go. So now think about that. As you're putting on display the riches of unsearchable riches, and now you're dealing with your neighbor. There was a survey. Come over to, uh, are you, well, I don't know where you're at. You need to be in Ephesians 3. Okay. <laughs> I don't know where, I don't even know where I'm at. Where am I? Ephesians 3. There was a survey several years ago that outside of the child molester, the most hated neighbor was a Christian. And the reason was, and they have a whole list of them, a Pew Research poll did this, that outside of the, the child molester criminal guy, the Christian, and you know what it was? 
was all of those things that you just thought about. Unfriendly, not helpful, not doing this, not doing that. Stay away from, don't talk to me, all of that stuff. But yet, you know that your neighbor is probably outside of your, in your sphere of influence, who you're going to hit the most. My neighbor, he used to have a tree and used to hang over. And I would say, hey, Will, your tree, and he'd just say, cut it down. Just cut it off. Like, okay. I was just, you know, what? And you know what? We did it. And then he cut the tree down. <laughs> it actually, it fell down in one of the storms years ago. But the thing is, is you begin to talk to him. Now, Will, and, and that was a, it was a bone of contention between us on his part. I could care less until he got leaning on the fence and I need, you know. But he was like, oh, right, 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 a stupid tree. Right, right, right. Why would she make me plant it? Right, right. This was his ex-wife, you know, that b- b- big blow up, big fights, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, enough. We're going to be, we're going to have peace. So you work that out. You see, your neighbor, what do they need to see? They need to see Christ. Work it through. You can do that. That's my point. Now, you're in Ephesians 3. Look at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. We're going to put on display for all to see, all of the people to see it, not understand it, not even comprehend it. They can't comprehend it because it's spiritually discerned. But they're going to see something different. I've told you the stories when I worked at the bus yard, go in 5 a.m. smiling. I was not smiling inside. It's 5 a.m., they're like, Rick, what is wrong with you? And, oh, man, hey, I'll tell you later. <laughs> I got I to go wake up, you know. No, you, you, what? you got a different disposition about work. They see it, seeing it. Now watch verse 10. To the intent that, circle that word, now, when, now under the principality and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now notice that verse carefully, because this is where we're going to go off next time from. We are going to make all men see the invisible fellowship, that invisible union, who we are in Christ, in the details of life. You have the right attitude about work. You have the right attitude about your neighbor. You have a right attitude. You got Romans 12 just flowing out of you. You got Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 just flowing right out of you. They see it. But also you have what? To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known how? By the church. Here's the big group again. What are we making known to that angelic host up there? The manifold wisdom of God. You see, we now have an impact into the angelic realm, that spiritual realm. Ephesians 6 over there, he says that our war is not with flesh and blood, but it's with what? Spiritual wickedness and high. We have an impact into the angelic. We're going to make it known. How are we going to make it known? We're going to proclaim it. And then we're going to demonstrate it, put it on display. And we're going to do that, and it's going to be made manifest by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the church, the local assembly. Now come to 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. In 1 Timothy, Paul gives that orderly maintenance of the local assembly. Here's here's how God's going to work today. He's going to work through a local assembly. That's how he's working. By the way, he isn't working on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. He works in a local assembly. Now, you got all that out there. It's great tools of ministry, but that's that's just what they are, tools. He works in a local assembly, so he gives the order of it. He says, here's the bishops and here's the deacons. Then in verse 14, he says, These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So he's going to talk now to the congregation. 
the local congregation. Here, the body of Christ is made up of believers who then gather together in locales. By the way, notice it's the house of the, the church of the, it's the house of God, the church of the living God. You know, there is a dead God out there. At Ephesus, they called her Diana. Down the street, you got her call her Queen of Heaven. You got her dis- different names. Here's the living God, the pillar and the ground. What does a pillar do? It holds up the message. What are we to do? Proclaim the message. Here it is, the ground. You, the ground is where that pillar is secure and steady. If your design and your goal is to proclaim the message, then you're going to keep the ground maintained. You're going to keep it free of debris and keep it cleared off. And just as you and I, in our thinking, in our mindset, keep our mind ground clear of garbage. I came up here during the week. I'm up here during the week. And with the storms and all, there's garbage everywhere. So I'm out picking it up. You know, uh, the goofy garbage can, I couldn't find the big black garbage can. It's down the street. The wind blew it down the street. I had Ricky look on the camera so I could figure out where it went. I, he's like, it's, it's across the street. I go down there, you know what I'm doing? I'm dragging that stupid thing back. Oh, the thing is heavy. Oh, the good thing it was empty, you know? And what do you do? You keep the ground clear in your thinking, in your mind. Why? Because what are we holding up? Here's the truth. Here's the Here's the faithful proclamation of the truth of God's Word and the faithful living of that truth. And when we proclaim the truth and we see that truth living in ourselves, then we see it begin to live in our community. And then we begin to do exactly what Ephesians 3 is talking about. We're making all men see, but now we're beginning to have an impact into the heavenly realm as well. Now watch verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. That verse says, without controversy. And yet there is so much controversy about this. Paul said, this should not be controversial. But it is. He says, God was manifest in the flesh. Now, Let's think about that, just that ver- part of that verse right there. God was manifest in the flesh. What is the context of 316? The local church. Okay. Now what everybody does is they run to John 1 verse 14, where the, fle- where the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And they say, see, when God was made flesh is the birth of Jesus Christ and his earthly ministry and the walking and so forth and all the activity on the earth. Is that the context of 316? So that's not what he's talking about. Did Christ do that? Yes. But that's not what Paul's talking about. What's Paul talking about? The house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar in the ground, the local assembly. And you and I, What are we to do? We're to make all men see. We're to put it on display, aren't we? Where? Right here. Galatians 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. Verse you all know, it's sitting on the back wall. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live, where? In the flesh. I live by. The faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave. Where do I live? Where am I living right now? I'm living right now in the flesh. In the details of life, who's to be on display? Not I, but Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You see, when Paul says, hey, local church, you're putting on display the doctrine, the truth, you're proclaiming it and you're putting it on display. You're, you're to let everyone clearly see it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, a tremendous chapter. Um, our ministry verse is verse 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the Truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. 
That's our ministry verse. How are we, we're, what are we, we're manifesting the truth. We're commending ourselves to every man's conscience. And you know what? If the truth isn't commending itself to you, then you won't be here. You're here because the truth is commending itself to you. Because what are we doing? We're all about teaching the truth. You've been sitting for almost 50 minutes now. You didn't know that. Almost. Okay? Look at verse 7. But we have the, this treasure. I love that. The treasure. The treasure of the ministry. The treasure of the, of the, of the gospel. Of the glorious light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus our Lord. We have this where? In an earthen vessel. Where, what is that? Flesh, baby, flesh. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Isn't God's wisdom wonderful? <laughs> I just put it over there in frail human pots so that they understand that their sufficiency is of me and not of themselves. When you're weak, I'm strong. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of also of Jesus might be made manifest, where? In our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. God is manifest where? In our flesh. The life of Christ is put on display in our lives. Where we come along, come over to Titus 2. Where when we come and we do and we operate and we put on display the unsearchable riches of Christ, we literally, in the moment in human history that we're doing that, give human history a look into the wonderful, glorious character and nature of God Himself. There He is. And He does it in you. Titus 2, verse 10, a great verse not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. What are we to be doing in all things? Adorning the doctrine. Make the doctrine look good. I got up this morning, I got dressed, I looked at Linda and I said, do I look good enough to go to church with you? And she just says yes. And shakes her head. <laughs> What do you do? You adorn, you, you make the doctrine look good, don't you? But you know what? It's really the doctrine making you look good. It's really adjusting you. We are, Ephesians 3, 9, we're to make all men see. We're to clearly see it. Clearly put it on display. All of the different characteristics and and attributes of who we are in Christ because it's not my life it's his life being lived out in my life and I am manifesting Christ in the flesh and I have an impact into the heavenly realm because the heavenly realm the angels well if this was all kept a secret and was hidden God before the foundation of the world guess who didn't know about it too the end, that angelic creation, until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul, who then wrote a few, a few words, and he writes it down, and they've been learning about it all along, and they sit, we'll, watch, we'll see the angels will sit there, and they watch, and they say, let's see how they behave. Let's see how they take these verses and take the life of Christ and put it on display. And you've got elect angels sitting there on your side rooting you. Go, go, go. And you've got the fallen angels sitting there going, I give you 20 to 1. He busts his toe and says a bad word. And guess what? The elect angel says, I'll take that bet. And you bust your toe and say a bad word. And he says, all right, see, look, you lost. And he goes, no, 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 hang on a minute. Let's see how he reacts. He said the bad word, but let's see what. And they begin to watch. 
And they begin to learn. And they begin to look into the details because they have no clue. They're learning just like you and I. But they're learning from you and I. As we put on display, as we proclaim the truth. So we'll get into that next time, 310. And I'll be honest with you folks, when Paul brings this stuff in, he takes us out into the universe like never taken before. And we begin to see the big cosmic plan of God, purpose of God. And we're going to spend some time going back. And you, what you, ha- you, know, what, you know what's fat, just wonderful? Almost beats honey butter on toast. Almost. Is this reach back into the Old Testament and it's there. And in the Old Testament, he talks about this heavenly host, but he never calls it the body of Christ. It's always the angels. It's always the cherubs and the seraphims. And yet he tells Job, the heavens are unclean in my sight. I clean them out. He doesn't reveal the program. Could you imagine Isaiah writing, Jeremiah writing, that the Lord is going to bathe his sword and blood in heaven and go, what is all that about? Because they have no clue. And Paul says, I know, you know. And guess what? In the future, everyone will know. There you are. It starts here in, and to the intent now. Starts right here now. Okay, so some exciting things to look at. And you know what? It's all in creation. The thing about the sons, the adults, he set it so in his creation to be that way. First, though, let's find, make sure you know who you are in Christ. Make sure you understand those unsearchable riches. Get out there and then make all men see that. Put it on display. Family and friends and then acquaintances. And when you do that, local assembly, together, you're doing that, then we come together and we do it together. And in this community, you don't know how many people walk by, see our sign out front with the website, and drop a note about what are you fools all about? What's going on? And when that happens, it's a great opportunity to write back and say, well, I'm, not a, I'm a fool for Christ, but here we go, and off you go. They see it. It impacts the community. And it needs to be a positive impact. Okay? All right, Johnny Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we just thank you for who we are in your Son. We thank you that you've made us a part of the eternal purpose and working and plan that you have for this universe. In your name we pray. Amen.